some videos are easier to record than others. Some, some are surprisingly difficult. Steam Engines has been surprisingly difficult. Mainly because it's what not to put in. I've so far recorded about six of these. And the one I did upload, YouTube didn't like previously. And I haven't liked the other five because they feel like they're tangential. Or they don't feel they don't cover enough. And it's getting that balance right. So I'm going to apologize now in advance. Because I may get the balance right. I might get it wrong. But I want it to go up. Because I want this year of technology and discovery to start. Steam power has a history. It has a very long history. We often think of power as this sort of steam as this sort of thing which has been around for a long time. But in human development, it's been around a nanosecond. It's one of those interesting things because of the factors which are involved in making it work. What do I mean by factors involved in making it work? Well, you put it down to it, you heat water in a in a suitable container and the steam which comes off you funnel in the appropriate manner and you use it for power that sounds remarkably simple this is usually the point at which people start to bring up going well we could have had steam at this point we could have had steam at this point there's been this such this 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 all correct but also wrong You see, there is only so much steam you can get out of a basic copper pot. Once you have to start metallurgy, once you have to start making that material better, it makes things more complicated. There's that old expression in science and technology, we are where we are because we stand on the shoulders of giants. It's hubristic, but true. Because for every leap in technology, for every time you jump up, you've had to create a thousand other things along the way. Because you've gone off track with the technology. You've gone left, right, instead of down the center. Or you've gone down the center instead of left or right. Steam power is one of those things. It looks simple, but in honesty, you are caging a very powerful beast. Steam, especially high pressure steam, that's a scary, scary thing. If you've ever seen some of the details of injuries which have happened to crew in engine spaces when engines have gone wrong, you would not think it was an easy thing to control. Now, this is also not to say that the people who were making these developments were not smart. That is another point of hubris when we presume that we are more intelligent than those who preceded us. We aren't. We have a greater baseline of knowledge because of the work they have done. And it's important to remember that that baseline of knowledge often depends on having a population large enough to generate knowledge and maintain it in a form of, well, we can't really call it institutional memory, but cultural memory perhaps, to actually build upon in the first place. All these things are a factor in how we develop, in how humanity evolves. If we consider this point now, 
I am talking to you on a video. This has been recorded on a camera and a computer. All things which, whilst they have been around in some form or other for 80 to 100, 150 years, have evolved to the point to which they can now work together in this form. And I can, one person at home, on their own, produce this. But let's look at my experience and my training. Am I a trained cameraman? No. Am I a trained television presenter? Sadly, no. I'm a university lecturer. I'm a historian. My skills are history, are analysis, anal analysis of documents and stats and information and occasionally sticking people down to interview them and coming at them in a way which is surprising because I'm not a journalist, so they are prepared for a journalist style inter interrogation and then they're facing historian style interrogation and we often slip stuff out of them without them even realizing it because we're nice in other words where do I get the skills from to do this it's a cultural skill it's not just something which I have there is a large number of people within the culture who have that skill for me to acquire the skill off by watching, by proximity, by discussion. That requires a certain population mass. And it requires a certain mass, critical mass, in terms of that cultural knowledge. Now, one of the interesting things is this is an aleophile. Elliot, Elliot file, uh, which is as designed and as described in Vitruvius, the architecture, the second most reproduced Latin work ever after Caesar's trips to Gaul, basically a very armed, long holiday excursion. But leaving that to one side, this is often described as the first steam engine, da 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 da. It's a rather cool toy more than a steam engine. It is really rather a, a rather more cool toy because it sounds so sensible. Oh yeah, they heated this vessel and this made this twin around, so surely they can turn that into something which can turn a wheel or a propeller. No, because it requires a lot more pressure, a lot more power to turn something like that than this. Although, interesting enough, there was another machine, not an aleophile. It's often, it's often mistaken for being the same thing. It isn't. But there was an altar in Egypt where when they heated, they set a fire of their, their, sort of, their gifts and honours to the gods. When they set them on fire, the altar heated up and because of the water moving hot water moving in there, it caused the doors to open, which I sure must have made many of them feel oh, God is present. Look, the doors are opening. It's a great piece of theatre. I'm sure there was a legitimate reason for it, but I'm also fairly certain the priests probably never enlightened anyone uh, if they didn't need to know exactly how the doors and why the doors opened. <laughs> But, let's be honest, I put 1700 years there, but it could be as 1800, 1900 years, it could be 2000 years, we really don't know, to get from there to the Slavery Steam Pump, the Slavery Steam Pump. And then it takes, by the way, 20 nearly years, well let's see. There are 14 years before we get to the new common atmospheric engine, and there's nearly a hundred years before we get to the Watt steam engine. And honestly, I would say the first and new common atmospheric engines are not really that great. They really aren't. And the Watt engine, there is a reason James Watt is thanked for watching that pot. Because his engine is 
a country mile. By a country mile and a half, probably. Better. And that is not hubris. That is not me being au fait. This is the simple fact. It is better. Still not great. And by the way, in the next slide we get on to what high pressure is in this time and you're going to be giggling. So, it's roughly, let's say, 1800 years before an earlier file appears and we get something like a working steam engine. And it's another 100 years before we get something which is considered an engine which is viable enough that it makes its, fa it makes its um, inventor famous. That's that's interesting. But there again, if we consider it, it takes a while to get a lot of people who are not only skilled in building the engines, but skilled in operating them. You think about it. You buy an engine for your mine shaft, and that's what most of these engines are being bought bought for. It's mine shafts. There is a reason why Britain does as well as it does in this period and its development. And it is no surprise it's during Napoleonic Wars when we consider what's going on. It's when Britain is having to stretch to supply a large navy, when it's having to stretch to provide a large, fairly large army for it. And therefore it is resource in high demand. So resource heavy demand. Manpower low. Tends to be a time when people start thinking of where are what are these things that we can do to make what we have already more efficient and that can make uh, the manpower we do have work better. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing I'm not going to cover a lot in this video are boilers because I'm going to get into them but I've done a lot of videos on boilers in the past which have gone into boiler technology I don't if I include it in this as well then I find that the first part of this video series ends up taking about four or five hours because of the sheer number of combinations of boilers and engines and, of course, the fact that you then have the debate of a water tube boiler, where water is passed through tubes surrounded by hot gas, or a fire tube boiler, where hot gas is passed through tubes immersed in water, and the same water also circulates into a water jacket, which surrounds the firebox. That tends to be used in steam locomotions. Locomotions. Tends to be. However, water tube boilers are more often used in marine environments. However, you can find exceptions to all these rules and many others. They just like being cruel. They really do like being cruel. After what? comes along, then comes along my favourite and innovator of this period. And this is the point I'm going to make. We're not quite sure when Trevithick first develops a high pressure engine. And please note, high pressure, 40 pounds per square inch, above atmospheric pressure. 40 pounds per square inch, rising to 50 pounds per square inch. This is heavy. And I've left it written out as that because I wanted to make the point. 40 pounds per square inch above atmospheric pressure. 50 pounds, and that is what is high pressure at this time. Because you need to make a vessel which can contain the pressure in order to harness it. You also need to make piping and equipment which can contain the pressure in order to harness it. So 
Just thinking, all you have to do to have a steam engine is a pot on a fire to you give you steam, and there you go, you can go away, you got steam, and why didn't the steam engines come earlier? Is silly. Now, here is one of the things you have in history. You often have innovator engineers, that is, engineers who will innovate and push things forward, and you have what I tend to call, but when I say I tend to call this, this is something I picked up off my engineering colleagues at King's University, but it's not something which is in the Oxford English Dictionary, so I'm not sure if it's just them or if it's an engineering term. Aficionators. So, an innovator will come with a new system of doing something. An aficionator will make it the most efficient it can be. One is really a challenge, and one is a long-term incremental process. As a rule, a good innovator is worth their weight in gold. Aficionators are slightly more common. They are worth three quarters of their weight in gold. If you can find an engineer who can do both, they are worth their weight in platinum and should probably be, so, have some form of worship going on, at least from the machines around them. Terrific is an innovator, and he develops all sorts of puffer engines, and you know they develop from the they differ from the Watt steam engine uh, from by various systems, but mainly it's because they combine two principles: starting with high pressure steam, which was then passed on the other side of the to the other side of the system, where it condensed, and there it acted as a sub atmospheric pressure engine. You have these two systems going on to give you extra power, make it more efficient and more energy inclusive. Now, when Trevific leaves for South America in 1816, because he's bored, he passes his stuff on, his patents, to probably one of the best officinators you have ever seen, a gentleman called William Sims. Now, William Sims, he's critical. But he starts building and adapting new engines using the patents from Trevific. And he is the one who really takes the engines to the high quality they become. And that's important. Because... Whilst these systems are still the pastime of the innovators, they are going to be one-offs. Okay, And if it's one-off systems, they don't have a, a chance really to develop a cultural memory, a cultural understanding. Why? Because innovators usually work in very small groups. Sometimes they even work solo. They don't explain anything to anyone. Aficionators usually work in teams. If you're thinking about, if any of you have an experience working with engineers, you're probably now mentally categorizing and going, were they an innovator? Were they an aficionator? And you're also possibly looking at your bosses in that category. As a rule, if you can find an, one of the platinum engineers, someone who's both an innovator and an aficionator, well, you can put them in charge of whole companies. That'll be great. It'll be amazing. It'll be fine. But, and this is one of the things which tends to annoy some of my students when they're thinking things through, but probably makes sense once they get into the world of work. As a rule, you tend to want the departments to be run by aficionators, not innovators. You want the innovators problem solving on the front, and dealing with problems, but you want an aficionator above them in charge, making sure all the other stuff gets done. If you have it the other way around, usually you end up with an innovator who thinks they're in charge, jumping from project to project, and a second in command who's an aficionator who actually is running everything, and that can lead you to a clash of personalities which can cause the company to fail, because the innovator, if they have a big enough ego, sometimes they do, uh, will ultimately feel that the aficionator is undermining them because everyone's actually going to the aficionator, not them, for decisions because they're the ones actually running things, will tend to fire them, 
and try and promote someone in their own image, and then the company falls apart because there's no one making sure the bills are paid and the little things are done which make things work. Why am I saying all this? Why am I getting this? Well, this is the problem you have for navies when it comes to adapting steam engines and why the various steam systems coming in come in in merchant ships first. Navies aren't good at employing people who are innovator engineers. They do not want one-off in their ships. They want replicable combat groups. This is part of the reason why, as it stands, engineering was set up separately. Because these people were quite so different and individual, and every engine on every ship was an individual. There is no surprise that at the point at which you finally decide to get standardization of boilers, of engines coming about, that the Fisher reforms go through. Because that is when you can actually do that. Because no longer are you dealing with things which are, if we consider it compared to current engines today, the closest similarity to it would be nuclear reactors, where the chemistry of every single reactor is individual. And whilst you can get, broadly speaking, similar operating capacities from them, especially in the modern ones, the chemistry will still be an individual. But if you go back to the older reactors, especially the earlier reactors, on things like the Enterprise, Beautiful ship, eight reactors, eight completely different sets of chemistry. Each reactor was its own very special, very perfect individual, which needed to be treated as such. And something which worked on one reactor could have completely different impact on another reactor, just because it felt like it, even though the theory was it shouldn't be so. So please meet the Charlotte Dundas. Now, she is a barge. A canal boat. And she is designed by William Simington for Lord Dundas. He ends up, because she doesn't prove successful in that, well, not she doesn't prove successful, but basically she pulls a load of barges down, a full load down the canal. It's named for Lord Dundas' daughter. Everything he can do to make it successful, he's, made, he's trying to make it as successful as possibly can. And yet, they don't like it because they're worried it's going to destroy the bank hedges of the canal. Not because it's got a crankshaft driving the wheel in a central housing. Not because it's got that. Uh, when we can think of all the later wheel-powered vessels which use chains or direct acting on a beam of some kind going across. No, no, this had a crankshaft. She works. She manages to move all the barges down and does it very successfully, but they are worried about the canals. And they are also to an extent, and this is going to sound strange, when they're looking at her, they're seeing something they can't quantify. They're seeing something which has potential, but how many of them will you need to build to really have an impact? And can you get people qualified in time? Now, interesting enough, despite the fact that there are many Americans who are developing engines and are doing very, very well, please note, I have mentioned Trevific as much as I have because he's Cornish and I don't believe Cornish engineers get enough recognition because they're great, they are amazing they, everyone always talks about Scottish engineers but trust me, the Cornish engineers do just as well and just as nutty I have a foot in both camps I can be equally proud of both but the Americans have to be proud because this was the first financially successful steamboat She's also pretty. She's named for, I think it was the River Hudson, which was originally called the North River. Let me check. Yes. Some alternate name for the southernmost portion of the Hudson River. 
And that's good because that's where she was operating. Now, when she first left, most people watching her off didn't think she was going to make it back. And she did. She made it back. She took a inordinate number of people of high standing. Basically, they did the whole thing of right then we're going to in, uh, we're going to invite some rich people. We're going to invite some journalistic people. We're going to invite some equivalent of influencers. I do love the way people think influencers is something new. There have been influencers around for a very very long time. It's just the form and the quantity of them which has changed. But again, that's something which, as the cultural knowledge of how to be an influencer has grown over hundreds of years, now more people are able to do it. And the technology which makes it possible. I'm going to be happy if, at the end of this video, you are questioning everything in front of you. And everything you know about the current modern world in terms of technology. So, it steams long, it stops at a beautiful estate, they have some time to stay, it goes to its destination, Albany, and then it turns around and comes back. And then it just keeps doing that trip. And that's the important thing, because it, of doing it is what matters. It achieves that trip in a time which no other vessel could have achieved it, against winds and against features of the time period which were meant nothing else could match its timing service. And the thing is, when you've got a steam power vessel, you can make a timetable. And this is why I'm going to talk about two different steam vessels now, because we have the first successful transatlantic crossing, which is the SS Savannah, which despite various discussions as to what might have happened when she reached Liverpool, which, honestly, I don't think did, because A, the, um, a, the War of 1812 had been over for a few years by the time she arrives, and B, it doesn't fit with any of the other accounts. There's this strange account which comes off in an American paper of how a British captain is basically being, is saying, you know, he felt that they're hosting the pennant of... The United States is, you know, insulting to them when they're coming into harbour, etc. In Liverpool, it doesn't fit. It doesn't fit because there's a lot of ships which are already training into Liverpool who are flying the American flag. Any captain who was going around saying that and causing trouble with that would probably be got rid of by the British in the nicest way. Not probably by kicking him out of the service, no. Uh, he would have been sent to... Probably the anti-slavery patrols off the coast of Africa. You know, we, they were, they did both the east coast and west coast of Africa. They did all sorts of things there. You know, there are always options going along that the British are getting involved in. There are plenty of places you can send a captain who is an otherwise capable officer, but who has the inability to be diplomatic with people who are coming into one of your principal harbours. The more junior they are, the easier it is to dispatch them to such places. But what does happen on the way across is, while she's in the South, Coast, the South Island, well, they basically see the steamship going along, and they've never seen a steamship before, so they think she's on fire. And then she doesn't, she doesn't stop, she's kept going. So they fire uh, this little British, basically, vessel, a frigate on, small frigate on patrol, fires warning shots and goes boom boom and then it comes alongside and goes can we come aboard and have a look around because it looks really cool yeah come on and that is more likely what the British will, uh, the British Royal Navy were like with it because they were incredibly interested in steam power actually fitting steam power to ships is a different matter because it's that whole thing of innovators versus aficionators what does the Royal Navy need? They need reliability, wherever they are in the world. What does a merchant ship need? Well, they're going from point A to point B. They're not hanging around at point C for weeks on end watching, going, what exactly is happening here? 
No idea, but something weird, so we're going to pay attention to it until we figure it out. But even Savannah doesn't establish a regular service. In fact, the first regular transatlantic service goes to the Great Western. And a vessel which will be in the service for almost 20 years between the Great Western uh, passenger ship, uh, passenger company, the Royal Mail, and eventually British government when she's used in the Crimean War to take some troops out to Crimea. She's a very useful vessel and very successful. She becomes the first regular transatlantic service in that she starts off. She reaches America, she refuels, she reloads loads of new passengers, and comes back. This vessel is what begins the age of the liner. And she wins the Blue Ribbon many times in her career. That is something. She is a well-built and very handily built vessel. Capable too. But still, what does she really represent? Well, this represents a maturation of technology. This represents a point to which things have reached viability for not only crossing the Atlantic, but crossing the Atlantic regularly. If you can do that... But please notice, she still has sails and masts. Why? Because it's still not 100% reliable, and it uses a lot of fuel, and these can be used instead of this, on okay, when the winds are right, to allow you to eke out more from the fuel and to save money. But it means you basically have to carry a double crew. You have to carry a load of stokers, a load of boilermen, and engineers, all to deal with what's in the hull, and a load of sailors to deal with what's above the hull. Which means it's expensive in terms of personnel, but luckily at this point they were fairly cheap. And this is something which sets the standard for really the next 40 years. In human terms, the transition from sail power to steam power alone is a blink of an eye. It's disturbingly quick. Made possible by the fact that, honestly, whilst the engines tended to be very different in terms of marine versus land versus locomotive, a lot of the principles could be applied across them. Now, side levers were original were the original popular engines, the original ones. Uh, this is the model of a twin side lever engine on the 1836 Thames River steamboat Ruby. And this is from the SS Pacific in 1849. Sidely engines, well, they're reliable. They're an adaptation of the beam engine, which, if we go back and look at them, you can sort of see why these engines are all called beam engines. But you can also see why this is an adaptation of that, because it's built very differently in order to save space, to fit inside a hull. Now, the main disadvantage was that it's large and heavy. Side lever engines are really frigging heavy. And honestly, they don't provide as much power as you might want. However, it's also very common for early engine type of warships, early warship, uh, warships which are early adopters of engines, 
as its low height compared to others of old time made it less susceptible to battle damage, i.e. it could be buried quite a lot below the waterline. Remember, this is pre... well... pre the Whitehead style torpedo, but of course not pre the torpedo because the torpedo at this period was a mine, not something which went zoom. Also, low center of gravity, which means ships are more stable in heavy seas. These are advantages. From 1820 until 1840, the Royal Navy got 70 steam vessels to enter service. Roughly. Roughly. About 50 of these are side lever. Using boilers set 2 a very low steam pressure. A very low steam pressure. Why? Because they're worried about the steam blowing up. They're also worried <coughs> about the effects, apparently, about the effect of the ships going boom, boom, boom on steam engines in the sea. Because remember, a ship's doing that. But things do evolve, and lots of people evolve, and then comes the grasshopper, which Okay, it is a form of beam or half lever engine, and it tends to be used on engines, as in railway engines, steam trains, but it's also used a lot in riverboats and tugs because it's quite compact, but not necessarily something you want to take to war or cross the Atlantic again. Of that comes the crosshead. Now, <laughs> eighteen thirty-six paddle steamer in New York. Built in between the paddle wheels is the tall square A-frame engine. You can see it if you look there. Within which can be seen the long piston rod near the top of its stroke, marking making a T with the horizontal crosshead. It's an engine and a half is a crosshead engine. I can't think why it wasn't popular with warship constructors. There's nothing about that which looks fragile and very, very damn easy to damage. But, yeah. This is the crosshead. Next, we have the walking beam. Now ah, that, that is a fun engine. The walking beam also can be called the vertical beam, overhead beam, or simply beam, but let's be honest, if you're calling this a beam engine, then frankly, there are a few other beam engines earlier which would like to have a conversation with you. Believe it or not, someone did decide that they could make this into a warship engine, and this is the USS Delaware as proof, built in 1861. Now, Please note, we can understand why that is. We can. Necessity is, after all, often a strange mother. Just like need is often a very strange father. I have no idea why my grandfather was assigned them that once, but they did. Now, the walking beam, with diamond shape, it's a efficient vessel. However, and as useful as they make it for shallow draft vessels, they really do make it for shallow draft, uh, good for shallow draft vessels. There is a point at which, um, how do I put this? The Americans get so obsessed with refining this, trying to make it more and more effective, this technology, that, um, a friend of this channel, in terms of we have talked about him a lot, Charles H. Cramp of William Cramp and Sons, those famous engineers who built the two of the best armor cruisers the US Navy was ever lucky enough to have in service, 
actually use this as an example of why American engineering was not, be uh, not managing to beat British engineering at the time. Basically, he said, look, just because it works, you are sticking with it instead of thinking of trying something new. And we are about two generations behind the British because of this. But it worked very well in shallow draft areas. So you can understand it. Right. So. Excuse me a second. I'm just going to check this slide. At the halfway point. There are many engines to come at this point. Steeple, Siamese, direct acting, oscillating. Some of them you honestly do not know how they come about. But the point is, and I'm trying to make this, is I'm working for all different engine types. So you have an idea of how things develop. This is a great picture to show off because it shows what is most people's impression of a steam engine. When I start talking to students, they usually start talking about variations on expansion engines and the boilers. And to that extent, we are looking at steam engines by the time they have been in service for honestly nearly a hundred years and the technology has been refined many many times beyond what it had originally started out as for most of that period engines look closer to this and this was very common many people very keen very happy with this engine very happy of these engines on shallow draft areas. It takes a while before you get this. So this is a refined technology. It's not a case of we jump from steam engines, we then have expansion engines, uh, well, sort of a single expansion, then double expansion, triple expansion, that's how engines progress, and then we get turbines. No, there's a, all sorts of routes the, the development goes off on before it gets to a point to which, yeah, you know what, those triple and later quadruple expansion engines and even perhaps a quintuple expansion engine are actually really good and will do the job. We can all mentally imagine what a quintuple expansion engine would look like and try and avoid it. It, there were good ideas for it. There were good ideas for it. But basically it required the sort of pressure boiler pressure which you tended to put with a high powered turbine at the end of the second world war it did scrape, uh, scrape every single bit of energy out of that boiler though this doesn't just come about it isn't a quick solution and that, that is one of the problems you can get with looking back in history and one of the reasons why this video is divided into two parts both are going to be roughly 50 minutes long. And the second part is going to come out on Friday. The reason things look easy when we look back is because we're seeing them often at their most efficient. The most recent cultural memory of them is those things at their most efficient, effective, and straightforward. When it appeared straightforward to the people at the time, because a lot of them had a cultural memory of when it had been far more difficult to use, or when it had been just starting out. So to them, this was amazingly easy. This was amazingly straightforward. There is also a difference of engines as you develop, which are for propellers versus paddle wheels. So steam power, it's useful. And engines, steam engines are 
interesting. And there's something which we'll discuss more as the year goes on. But I wanted to introduce, introduce you to some of the ideas of them. And part two, we'll get into some of the ideas of more of them. Thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed. And, um, well, the question for today is, what is your favorite piece of technology, which, for they, which today is taken for granted and just presumed to be eh, easy, but actually is incredibly difficult when anyone actually thinks about it? Thank you very much for watching. What's what coming up? We have Bitron's French interwar carrier aviation. Why did the French Navy not more fully embrace carrier aviation after World War One? I? I hope you're going to enjoy that one. It should be a good one. Thank you for watching. As I said, part two comes out on Friday instead of a comment response video this week. There will be a comment response video coming out again next week, though, so don't worry. They will be coming out. And YouTube and I will be back on friendly working together terminology.